Let's go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 4. That's where we're going to begin, beginning in verse number 35. We're in this series, walking through the book of Mark, with this phrase, to know and follow Jesus. Why are we digging in? Why are we in this pursuit? Because we were made, we were designed for a relationship with him. You heard it from the young men, even from the baptistry this morning. We were made for a relationship with him. But there's a tendency even to come to church and to tune out exactly who Jesus is. And the Lord, I'm telling you, is walking on this journey, is calling us to himself, wants us to know who he is, has made a way for us. And we are called, those who have surrendered their life to the Lord, we are called the redeemed. And we have a story to tell, but that story is focused in on him and his deliverance. And what could possibly keep us from him are some big issues. One is fear. Another one is unbelief. And that's why we're beginning in Mark chapter 4, beginning in verse number 35, because it is about a storm, a storm that arises and there are, uh, there's a revealing that takes place. Such a necessary place for us to begin. So the honor of God's word, if you would stand with me this morning, Mark chapter 4, beginning in verse number 35. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And after leaving the crowd, they took him with, with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he, re- he woke, rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, peace. Be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even wind and sea obey him? Pray with me this morning. Lord Jesus, May we with certainty be able to answer who then is this? Lord, you are the king. You are the Lord of lords. You are the savior of the world. You are God on most high. Father, may you speak to us this morning. Father, may we surrender to you our fear Surrender to you our unbelief and truly become a child of God. Lord, we pray that, Lord, you will speak to us in the midst of the chaos of life. Show us your strength this morning. Father, may you truly strengthen our belief and may we walk out of here a different person than we walked in. And Lord, may we have a story to tell, a story of your rescue a story of your deliverance, of your mercy and your grace. And we pray for this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Here we begin with a storm. And those who are in the storm are experienced. You know that the first disciples, many of them were professional fishermen. And so storms were nothing new to them. They are on the Sea of Galilee, that big lake. And here comes a major storm. Jesus is asleep. And they are scared for their lives. This is not a overreaction. This is a real storm. They wake Jesus up. And what's, what do they wake him up? And what do we want to say to God all the time? Don't, don't you care? Don't you care that we're perishing right now? Don't you care that I'm in the midst of a storm? And Jesus, demonstrating divine power speaks to the wind, speaks to the waves. And what's the scripture say? There was a great calm. And in that midst, he turns to them and asks two questions that we must face. Why are you so afraid? And where is your faith? 
Let those hit you for just a moment. What is it that great causes great fear in you? Storms, chaos, they are revealers of what we truly fear. No better time to talk about fear than right now. In a couple weeks, what is it? It's Halloween. Everything on TV is to scare you right now, right? Isn't that true? Everything about every fear that you have, every snake, every spider, every scary clown is appearing. You know what I'm saying? You know, I will not go in a room where a doll is this tall. I'm telling you right now. It will never happen. Ever. I've seen too many movies. But I'm telling you right now, there's great fear. There's great fear in us. And I'm telling you, it comes out with pressure. It's revealed with the chaos, with the storms. Because we are at times ruled by our fear. Why are we so afraid? What is it that captures our thoughts? What is it that keeps you up at night? What is it that's turning your stomach? What is that fear that rules your heart? And the Lord at times allows things to take place to reveal it because it's actually a lack of faith. It's actually a lack of belief in the one who controls all things. He's just demonstrated once again, not the very first time for these guys, he's demonstrated once again, he is in control. He is God. And he looks at them and he asks them, where is your faith? Why is it still lacking? And there's this moment here, look at the scripture, where it's, he says to them, why do you still have no faith? And they were filled with great fear. In the wording there, it's really particular. In the wording there, it's a fear of a great fear. I mean, they are overwhelmed at this moment. A.T. Robinson, a great theologian says, in this moment, they are growing. They're growing in their comprehension of the Lord. And they're also growing in their apprehension of the Lord. They're like, who is this guy? This guy is, man, he's otherworldly, and he is. He's come, and he's, he, he is God in the flesh. He has showed up, and he's revealing himself in this moment. And he asks a key question. Look at the key question they ask. Who then is this that even wind and sea obey him? Who is Jesus? Do you know him? Who is this that even the sea and the wind obey his word? Do you know him? Have you experienced him? Because we're going to jump into Mark chapter 5. And in Mark chapter 5, there are three key stories. Three key stories of our brokenness, our brokenness, meeting the great physician. And that brokenness is one of personal brokenness. It's that brokenness of a child facing imminent death. It's a brokenness of a disease that has ruled our lives. And that brokenness meets a great physician and we experience his healing. The chapter's too long. I'm going to spare you. I'm going to give you a little heads up. For those of you who are worried that we we're about to go through the entire chapter, we're going to dig into the very first story of the demonic. And I want you to see God's redemption and deliverance. And I want you to see him. Change not only this guy's life, but change our lives. Look in Mark chapter 5, beginning in verse number 1. Here we go. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately, Mark loves that word, immediately, there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. Now, the story kind of takes a little bit of abbreviation here and gives us a bit of a summary of this guy's life beginning in verse number three. He lived among the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and bruising himself with stones. Let's hang here for a moment. This is what sin does. Sin destroys. Now I know we like to think that we're not at this place, but I'm telling you right now, sin always takes us further than we ever wanted to go. Here, this man is out of control. His life is out of control. According to the scriptures, he's possessed by demons, 
He is so out of control. He has no control over his life and he is crying out. He's living among the dead. He's living among the tombs. He is unclean. And according to a holy God, we are unclean. And that only progresses. And I'm telling you, if you don't face the reality of where sin can take you, I'm telling you, you are in a dire circumstance. I've got a great shot up, a quote up on the screen here for you. Listen to this. As long as people, that means us, are ignorant of their sin, of its nature, and of its consequences, they can understand neither themselves nor God. Only when we own before God our sinfulness and our willing captivity, listen to that, and our willing captivity to its desires, will we long for redemption from these bonds. To fail at this point is to fail to see our need for redemption. To trust in what we are is to build an insurmountable barrier to true faith in Christ. This is where sin takes you, where it takes you completely away from the Lord, where you think that the answer is found in yourself. It's found in your performance. It's found in your actions, that somehow you can overcome, that all things are going to turn out okay, that you somehow are going to overcome the difficulties in life. And we have to face a very serious predicament, and that is we are not very much unlike this unclean man who has been reveling in the things of this world, who has been, people have been trying to control him, been trying to keep him back, trying to hold him back, but he is uncontrollable and he is now living a life of destruction, crying out, harming himself, self-harm, and he is desperate. And that desperation in that moment meets the king. Verse number six. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying, Jesus was saying to him, come out of this man, you unclean spirit. Here comes the demonic. And once again, just as we looked at previous chapters, the lessons we learned from the enemy. Here comes the enemy. He has no choice but to recognize who Jesus is. How many times do we fail to do that? He comes and he recognizes that he is God, most high God. That he's not just some ordinary man, that he is God in the flesh. He recognizes his authority. He bows down before him, realize Not willingly, but has to. He has to recognize that authority. He has to bow down to that authority. We've been given this beautiful option, choice, to be able to choose to worship. He has to, even though he wants to rebel. And he's going to continue to rebel. He doesn't want to surrender, but the authority of Jesus makes him surrender. There is nothing you are experiencing that Jesus is not greater than. Hear that. There is nothing that has captured you and is holding you captive that he is not greater than. In your Bibles up on the screen, I want you to look back to Psalm 107. Psalm 107 is actually a parallel passage to this entire chapter of Mark chapter five. I want you to listen to verses nine through 16 for just a moment. For he satisfies the longing soul and the hungry soul he fills with good things. Some sat in darkness and in the shadow of death, prisoners in affliction and in irons. Does that sound familiar to our passage? For they had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. So he bowed their hearts down with hard labor. They fell down with none to help. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble. Do you hear this? And he delivered them from their distress. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and burst their bonds apart. 
Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. Listen to this. For he shatters the doors of bronze and cuts into the bars of iron. Do you see the word picture for just a moment? God is kicking down the door of that which separates you from him. Do you see this? Do you see the priorities of the Lord Jesus? Do you see his ministry? He has come to bring redemption and restoration. And he is willing to kick down a door in order to get to you. Because he loves you. He's willing to break apart those bars of iron because he loves you. And I want you to see what he's doing in the life of this man is what he wants and desires to do in our lives. He wants to break those bonds. He wants to make us free. And he comes and he's speaking and he is calling out. Listen, to come back. let's come back to this in verse number nine. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? He replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. Mark includes this detail. Legion was a a group of soldiers that was over 6,000 strong. So this man, according to this name, is being controlled by an army of demons. Why is this detail given? I don't want you to miss this. This detail is given because the strength within this man is great, but he's not greater than Jesus. Hear that. Too many times we diminish The power of God, we underestimate the power of God and we overestimate the power of this world. And we allow fear to enter into control and we lost our faith. And Jesus says, what is your name? Once again, showing that his name is greater. When are we gonna believe this? That the name of Jesus, you are saved. The name of Jesus, There is healing and there is power. The name above all names is Jesus. And his demonstrating once again the power in him. Take a look at the scripture. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside and they begged him saying, send us to the pigs, let us enter them. So he gave them permission and the unclean spirits came out and entered in the pigs in the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and were drowned in the sea. The herdsmen fled and told it to the city and in the country and people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had had the legion sitting there, clothed. And in his right mind, and they were afraid. Jesus delivered this man, delivered him. And when other people show up, they recognize him as the one who was out of control. And now he is sitting, a place of learning. He is clothed. God has showed value upon him and has provided for him. He is in his right mind. They recognize that there is peace in this guy's life where there was not peace, where there was out of control. Now there is peace. But isn't it ironic that instead of being joyful, what did the scripture say? What was their reaction? They were afraid. They were afraid because they didn't value the Lord. Look what they valued. Verse number 16. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. Why don't you listen to what James Edward of Commentary says. In the eyes of Jesus, the rescue and restoration of one person is more important than vast capital assets. Compared to the redemption of a human being, the loss of swine herds, considerable though it was, does not rate mentioning. He values his children 
above the valuable things of this world. Was that herd valuable? Absolutely. Monetarily speaking, very valuable. But his children are more valuable. Think about it for just a moment. What would you do to rescue your child? What monetary um, price would you place on getting to your child? Rescuing them, delivering them. You know in your heart right now, even we as human beings know the right answer to that question. How much more does our heavenly father who says, I will do whatever it takes to get to you, to rescue you, to get to your world, to settle your life, to change you, to rescue you. We have so much to be thankful for because he is our redeemer. Do you remember what we began this service with? Let the redeemed say so. Let us cry out. Let us tell of his deliverance. Let us proclaim his goodness. Too many of us are wrapped up in our own world. We're more concerned with the the thread on our social media than we are with the word of God. We're more consumed with the things that are happening in our political world than we are with the kingdom of God. We are kingdom people. We are about his mission. We are about his glory. We are about his name. Is that the way we live? Because the Lord will allow storms to take place to reveal what we fear and what we believe. And do we believe in him? Are we rejoicing in him? Are we bowing and surrendering to him? Are we praying to him? Are we calling upon his name? Jesus even says to Jairus in the most dark moments of life, do not be afraid, only believe. And that's what he's saying to us this morning. Don't be afraid. Believe. I'm revealing myself to you for a reason and for a purpose because he is calling upon us to be his witnesses. Take a look at the scripture. Verse number 18. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. And he, Jesus, did not permit him but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis, which means 10 cities, how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. I want you to see the heart of Jesus here. Who just rejected him? That whole town, that whole region, right? They said, Jesus, get out of here. We don't want anything to do with you. You just killed everything that we value. We don't want you here. Jesus changes one man's life. And that man wants to be and go with Jesus. And what does Jesus say? No, go home. Go to the people who just rejected me and tell them who I am. Do you see this? Do you see the heart of the Lord? This region just rejected him and he's sending them a witness. He yearns for them even though they rejected him. You may be here this morning in your heart, you may be so hard right now. You may be so fired up right now. You may be like, I don't want anything to do with the Lord this morning. He still loves you and he's coming after you and he's going to share with you. He's going to draw you. He is going to give a witness to you of his mercy and his grace. Do we live on mission? Are we, do we understand that the Lord has sent us? What is your story? Is your story telling of the goodness and the grace that the Lord has had upon you? Do we tell his story or do we hide it? Do we put it under a bushel or do we allow that light to shine for the world to see, to know who he is? Guys, do you realize the Lord is calling us to himself and he's calling us to be on mission with him? And I'm telling you that mission is gonna reveal 
our fears and what we really believe. And my heart, my hope, my prayer this morning is we would turn to Jesus. We would know who he is and we would know that we are sent and with great excitement, we are gonna go and we are gonna tell his story and allow people to marvel at the goodness and the grace of our Lord Jesus. Pray with me this morning. Lord, we come to you and with great humility, we bow our heads before the king. With all heads bowed and all eyes closed, what do you fear? What do you believe? Where is your faith? I want you to take the next few moments. I want you to get alone with the Lord. And I just simply want you to pray. And I want you to be open and honest with the Lord this morning. What do you really fear? And what do you really believe about Jesus? There are two types of people here this morning. Those who have surrendered their lives to Jesus and those who have not. If you've surrendered your life to Christ, are you living for him? What is it that you need to surrender to him this morning? What is keeping you back? What has more control upon you than him? This is a moment of confession, a moment of repentance this morning. For those of you who do not know Jesus, you've not surrendered to him, what's holding you back? He has the power to save. He has the power to forgive and to give you the gift of eternal life. The scripture says, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Not one is holy, no one is holy. The scripture says that even while we were still enemies, that Christ died for our sins, that there's death in sin, but there's life, eternal life in Christ Jesus. The scripture says that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that he was raised from the dead, we shall be saved would you like to take that step of faith this morning I'm going to lead you in a prayer nothing magical about this prayer nothing special about it it's just a simple way to voice what the Lord is doing in your life right now if you want to be a follower of Jesus pray this prayer after me where you are Lord Jesus Lord, I confess my many sins to you this morning. I am a sinner. And Lord, I surrender my life to you. Lord, be my Lord and Savior. I believe in my heart that you are alive and that you have just given to me the gift of eternal life. And I promise to be a follower of Jesus all of my days. With all heads bowed and all eyes closed, if you prayed that prayer this morning, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand where you are. If you prayed that prayer, thank you. Goodness, several of you, several. We're about to turn to a time of response. For those of you who prayed that prayer, you need to tell somebody. You need to come and you need to tell someone what the Lord is doing in your life. For those of us who are followers of Jesus, we need to respond to the invitation of the Lord and surrender to him that which is holding us back, that which is, has a grip upon us. 
The Lord wants to do a mighty work here this morning and it's called turning to him. Lord Jesus, give us the strength this morning to turn to you, to give everything to you. Father, we pray that you have your way with us and that, Lord, there will be, this will be a holy moment. This will be a moment of redemption, a moment of restoration. And that, Lord, your name is glorified in this moment. And we pray for this in the name of Jesus.